when we started the series, I asked you all to kind of take a moment to try to take some time for yourselves in this hour and a half that we have to reflect on what the speakers said, to kind of give pause to your day. And I'm gonna ask you to do the exact same thing now. As hokey as it may seem, if with me you'll take a pause, take a deep breath. If you wanna close your eyes, feel free to, but I'll ask you to open them in a minute. And I wanna just read a quote to you about entrepreneurship. Deneem Silhani said, the primary characteristic of an entrepreneur of the future should be a deep sense of responsibility to humanity. The primary characteristic of an entrepreneur of the future should be a deep sense of responsibility to humanity. Okay, now you can open your eyes again. With that in mind, our next speaker, Dr. Amit Narayan, excuse me, Narayan, founder and CEO of Autogrid, has been recognized as a leader with a great sense of responsibility. Autogrid launched in 2010 as a software company whose intent is to provide the world with cheaper, more reliable, and cleaner energy forecasting electrical consumption and generation. His work has been widely recognized. In fact, I feel like he's one of our most recognized speakers. And recently, Autogrid received the Red Herring Award for North America, and Dr. Narayan received recognition as the World Economic Forum's 2015 Technology Pioneer. Both of these institutions take pride in figuring out what's the next greatest thing. Uh, they have looked at Nest, they've recognized Facebook, they've recognized Google before others have. They look at companies and individuals who demonstrate leadership, innovation, viability, and potential impact. Autogrid evolved from Dr. Narayan's work at Stanford University where he's the director of the Smart Grid Research in Modeling and Simulation. He's known for his expertise in research and development, and I feel like that expertise probably is founded in a solid education. Perhaps you will know that he got his PhD at UC Berkeley in Electronical Engineering. <laughs> While he was at Berkeley, he was part of the very prestigious CAD group, Computer Automated Design, in case some of you don't know what that stands for. Um, and upon graduation, he worked on the flagship product for the Monterey Design Systems and then went on to found Berkeley Design Automation, focused on con excuse me, semiconductor design software. BDA's products were adapted by the top, uh, the top semiconductor companies and he received the EDN prestigious Innovation of the Year Award about 10 years ago. Wasn't the end of his awards. From BDA, he went on to head up product development for Magma Design Automation, which made somewhere between 50 and 30 and 50% of semiconductor chips used in our consumer electronics today. In his work with CAD, BDA, and Magma Design, he interacted fairly extensively with Dean A. Richard Newton, for who the series is named, and he might be able to say a few words about him as well. Uh, I always think it's interesting to recognize Dean Newton because he had an incredible amount of influence on a lot of people and a lot of businesses. Dr. Narayan has published over 20 papers about design automation and holds seven U.S. patents. We are honored to welcome on the stage Dr. Mitt Narayan. It's an honor to be here uh, giving this lecture, which is uh, instituted in the memory of Professor Richard Newton, whom I had the great uh, good fortune of interacting very closely with, as Vicky mentioned, uh, while I was a graduate student uh, in what was then called the Berkeley CAD group. I think uh, it goes by a different name now. And uh, Professor Newton, um, I I'm sure you guys are too young to have directly uh, known him, was a true visionary. Uh, he really believed that technology can and should always be applied uh, to improve the state of the society. And so it's even bigger pleasure for me to be here uh, and talk about the uh, technological solution that I think has ha had an, a tremendous impact on everything that we do uh, as, as society, how we work and how we uh, how we function, and that is really the electricity grid. In fact, the grid has worked so well over the years 
that we don't really think about it. We haven't seen uh, a lot of need to make many significant changes to the grid. And it's been working uh, beautifully. It has allowed us to build some incredible things. Uh, we can carry a supercomputer in our pocket, uh, which is connected to the uh, world's entire information, and we can do incredible things with this. But as we start thinking about uh, how we are going to provide uh, electricity to uh, 1.4 billion people around the world who still don't have, a, have access to affordable and reliable electricity today, the current system, which is very reliant on fossil fuel burning uh, power generators, is simply not going to scale. The environmental impact uh, of, of building new fossil fuels is, uh, is <clears throat> something that I'm sure all of you are uh, aware of. So I got inspired by this, uh, what I think is one of the uh, biggest challenges of our lifetime, which is to see how we can provide not only affordable and reliable electricity, but something which is also sustainable for all of humanity uh, about five years ago. And at that time, uh, after finishing my PhD from Berkeley, um, I was uh, working in the semiconductor industry where my team had uh, finished writing the software which was used to design some of the chips that went into the first iPhone. And as I started thinking about what I could potentially do in this area, uh, I think a, a quote from Professor Newton, uh, which he used to often say, uh, came to my mind. He said that if you are working on a problem and you are not able to find a solution or the solution is too hard, then perhaps you should just change the problem and think of a problem that you know an answer of or a solution of, and then maybe you will be able to solve the problem that you're working on. And so that's what I ended up doing. Um, what I, uh, I, I realized that even though these chips that I've been working on are really tiny uh, in terms of physical dimensions, the signals on these have to travel so fast that each one of these little tiny metal wire starts behaving as a transmission line. And just to keep up with the Moore's law growth over the years, uh, there was an incredible body of knowledge uh, and algorithms that have been created to optimize and squeeze every last bit out of these uh, systems with millions of transmission lines. And so I thought that uh, because the laws of physics generally don't change, we could use some of the same algorithms and same math to see how to make the grid run more efficiently. And that's what uh, uh, I started working on. But as I started looking at this incredibly complex system, which is the electricity grid, uh, there was one more problem that became very, uh, uh, very critical. And that was that uh, the behavior of the grid, unlike the semiconductor chip, depends on behavior of you and me who derive electricity from the grid. And so uh, as, you, I mean, uh, as you change your behavior, the grid has to somehow adapt to those changes. So for example, if you uh, turn a light switch on, somehow the grid has to sense that and uh, some generator somewhere far off has to respond in real time to keep up with this uh, variability. And so understanding of this human behavior was very fundamental in, uh, in making the grid run more efficiently and understanding its behavior. And that's where I realized that perhaps we can use some of the techniques that we have developed uh, in other domains like the internet, uh, where not only can we understand the human behavior, but we can influence that behavior through personalized recommendations and machine learning and uh, uh, targeted suggestions to influence the human behavior. And by doing that, we can uh, run the system more efficiently. So everything uh, came together. Uh, we were able to use the same technologies that the grid helped us invent, namely powerful computers, machine learning, big data algorithms, uh, connected computers back onto the grid. And now we have made uh, uh, this grid uh, into what we call as a smart grid, where data uh, starts becoming a new source of power. So uh, before I get into, uh, into the details of, of what the smart grid is, I think that it would be good to also see what's happening in the industry today. Uh, there are some very fundamental changes which are happening in, the, in, in how we consume electricity and how that electricity is supplied to us. So here is a chart that uh, I've taken from uh, uh, one of the presentations at the World Economic Forum, which shows how the market capitalization for the top 10 electricity companies in Europe has changed over the last six to seven years. And these top 10 companies collectively have lost about half a trillion dollars, that's a T, uh, in market cap uh, in the last six years. Some of the largest companies, uh, a company called Eon uh, that we work closely with, 
um, has announced fundamental changes into how they are uh, doing their business. So instead of uh, a vertically integrated utility where they own their own nuclear generators and uh, coal-fired power plants and the distribution network as well as serving the customers, they have split the company into two where the company which focuses on fossil fuel burning generation and nuclear is now uh, spun off as a separate entity while the new Eon is focused on uh, renewables and uh, energy services. And so the utilities are responding to these changes, this, the, this loss in market cap by fundamentally transforming uh, their businesses. And so uh, it would be uh, interesting to see what's driving uh, some of this behavior. And so there are, uh, in my opinion, there are uh, three uh, fundamental shifts which are happening in the industry, uh, which, which is uh, causing a lot of market cap erosion, also creates a lot of opportunities for new business models. The first is to the business model itself. And the traditional sort of business model that utilities have had is that they build these large generators, and then they sell electrons uh, to you and me as consumers, and they charge a markup on those electrons. In the past, uh, that was a great business model. They were guaranteed a certain rate of return. But as you start uh, looking at the supply sources today, uh, there is a tremendous pressure on that business model through these distributed energy resources where you and I can now buy a solar panel, and with the cost of uh, storage coming down, we can even uh, cut ourselves off of the grid in some cases uh, and just completely be a self-generating uh, entity. Now, what that creates is a, is a downward spiral uh, for the business model because the way traditionally electricity rates work is that uh, the richest or the most profitable customers end up paying not just a higher overall price for electricity, but also the marginal uh, price for electricity, which means that every unit of electricity that you consume becomes more expensive if you consume more units of electricity, which also in turn means that if you are the most profitable customers for the utilities, uh, you are the most incentivized uh, to put solar on your rooftop and get off the grid or reduce your consumption at least, which then in turn means that the rates for everybody else who are being served by that utility goes up, uh, creating a new slice of customers who are now uh, better off by putting solar on their uh, rooftop. And that creates a downward spiral. Some people have started calling it the utility death spiral uh, in, in response to this. And as the prices start coming down, it puts even bigger pressure on the, on the utilities. The second sort of trend which is happening is around connectivity. Uh, whether you look at this building or, or your home, more and more things that you own are now connected. Uh, which means that the consumers, for the first time, have not only the awareness, but the tools to take their energy usage in their own hands. Apart from putting solar and storage, they also have control on their consumption, whether they are putting in smart thermostats or electric cars or other uh, connected uh, devices in, into their home, uh, which again changes their relationship with the customers, uh, with their utilities. And then the third trend, which uh, sitting in California is not always apparent, is around deregulation. Markets worldwide are uh, getting deregulated when it comes to retail electricity. Here, you and I have to purchase our electricity from PG&E, but if you go to Texas, for example, and 20 other states in North America, you can buy your electricity from uh, any one of hundreds of competing retail electricity providers. Worldwide, about 700 million customers are on these so-called deregulated uh, electricity rates. All of Europe is fully deregulated. Uh, you can choose your provider. Uh, Japan is getting deregulated in 2016, and uh, China has a policy of, of deregulation. So what this, this means is that with all of uh, with these trends, utilities, for the first time, have to start thinking about what their uh, business is going to look in the future. In fact, the very notion of a utility is changing, and these utilities are now transforming into energy service providers for the companies. Now, along with this, uh, there is a realization that for the first time, uh, they have to start thinking of their end users, uh, not what they used to uh, think of them, uh, which was a term that they would use uh, called rate payers, but really as, as customers. And to be able to do that, they have to now worry about how to retain these customers, how to acquire new customers, how to create new services for them. And they are, uh, all, and all of them are realizing that in this more competitive world where customers have choice, they need to take advantage of the data that they are collecting from, uh, from their systems. Now, the good thing is that this entire 
uh, supply chain all the way from generators to your homes is heavily instrumented or is getting more and more instrumented uh, every day. And there is a tremendous amount of data that is now getting collected from every uh, piece of equipment uh, along this chain. So there is actually uh, some very clear opportunities to improve the efficiency of the system, uh, both in terms of how do you manage the assets and how do you use these assets to, uh, to create new services. So what uh, 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 my uh, thesis is that the utilities of the future will change from being just a provider of electrons, uh, which are being pumped uh, on this network in a one-way manner, to someone who is in charge of managing the demand and supply and balance the, balancing this demand and supply as more renewable sources uh, come onto the grid. And in this world, the value shifts from not just owning the assets that they used to do, but actually uh, using these assets more effectively and optimizing the use of these assets uh, through software. And there are two sort of big uh, areas that we are focused on and uh, we see a lot of value. One is uh, around increasing the utilization of these assets. These are very high value assets uh, that are getting deployed and how can we predict uh, whether these assets are going to be available and maximizing that utilization. The second uh, uh, big area is monetizing these assets. Many of these assets are underutilized. They're used for very few hours during the year. And uh, if they can be controlled and they can be utilized more effectively, uh, the cost of these assets can come down and the value to the end consumers can go up. And so those are the two areas that we are looking at. Uh, these two areas are important uh, when you look at the entire value chain of electricity. So if you look at the value chain of electricity, you have the utilities on the uh, on the left, and then you have the end customers, which could be residential customer or a commercial or industrial customer. But you have a number of players in the, in the middle. And they are all uh, looking to see how they can create value and how, how they can uh, become more profitable in, uh, in this new world of energy. So the, the utilities, as I mentioned, have a big need to engage with their customers, to retain their customers. And the progressive utilities are already creating their uh, deregulated businesses that can uh, target these customers. Uh, the service providers, there are many different types of service providers, companies who sell uh, solar to you, companies who are providing different types of energy uh, services. They all are now uh, targeting the same end customers for their services, and cost of acquiring these end customers is very high. So what's happening is that there is a, a huge amount of consolidation which is happening in this industry, and they're all uh, trying to see how they can become more profitable by selling more services to the end customers. And managing flexibility is one of the key services that uh, creates value for these uh, end customers. The other area which is very interesting, and I think there is a lot of new innovative business models uh, that are going to come, is the whole uh, energy internet of things vendors. So these are companies who are making connected things. These are your tes Teslas of the world, uh, Google through Nest, and, and even companies, traditional companies like GM. GM and Schneider, who are now taking their end devices, which used to be uh, these standalone dumb devices, and now putting connectivity to it so that you can now control it using your iPhone. Now, what happens is that a lot of uh, these devices, even though uh, they're cool, uh, are also very expensive. And customers are now struggling to see whether there is enough value in these devices for them to uh, spend the extra money. And a number of these uh, companies are finding that the value actually comes from the grid by using these devices and providing services to the, uh, to the electricity grid. And they are trying to create new services. Uh, for example, Nest has a program they market it as rush hours, which is really providing a peaker plant to the utility uh, in exchange for uh, a reduced price uh, rebate for their thermostats. Uh, which can create new services to the grid, provide value to the grid, reduce the cost for the customers, and in turn drive the sales of their devices. And then of course, customers want lower cost, uh, higher services. So across this value chain, we are seeing a new type of market which is emerging, and this market is looking at uh, monetizing uh, the flexibility that comes from energy assets. So just in terms of how much value is in, uh, uh, in this supply chain, if you look at the, the US supply chain for electricity, about 20% of all generators are used for less than 50 hours during the year. And we spend uh, collectively about $400 billion in managing that infrastructure. So uh, the opportunity, one of the opportunities here is to see how we can reduce this peak consumption through different types of 
uh, programs. These could be pricing programs, these could be other types of incentives that the customers have, where they are exposed uh, to this, uh, uh, this problem and this opportunity, where they can reduce their consumption at the right times, and we can uh, make the entire system uh, a lot more efficient in this process. So, uh, so I talked about the, the demand side opportunity, that's pretty big. Uh, the same opportunity exists on the supply side. As you put more solar and more wind, in the past, by building these peaker plants, you could at least keep the system alive, system stable. Uh, even though it was very inefficient, you could always build these peaker plants, uh, which, which can come on and off. But now, as you put more solar and wind, the entire, uh, if, if you uh, don't use intelligent software, you have to put even more backup generators uh, for the day when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. And that increases the cost of putting these assets uh, dramatically. So again, uh, by doing this kind of flexibility management where you can take uh, anything uh, that allows you to uh, either manage or control the supply or the demand, uh, you can uh, transform the whole system and that market becomes even, uh, even bigger. And then finally, I mean, as you get these energy IoT devices, how do you optimize the entire supply chain? I believe creates one of the biggest opportunities for us uh, in, the, in, uh, in the present times. So, uh, so in all of this, uh, the key thing is that uh, you have a number of different assets and you have a market that allows you to monetize these assets. It's almost like Uber, where you have a car which is not driven most of the times, and if you use it, you can make some money. You have a thermostat in your home, which is uh, just there, and if you can move it around by one or two uh, degrees, which you would normally not even notice, you can make money because the grid is willing to pay, uh, pay for it. And so we, uh, as a company, and there are other companies in this space who are also doing uh, similar things, uh, we are providing a software system which makes it very easy for these assets uh, that are increasingly getting deployed in homes, in buildings, in factories, uh, to participate in these energy markets, which could be uh, general wholesale markets or markets that utilities are creating. And we make it easy so that instead of uh, these companies just selling electrons, they actually become buyers of flexibility. They can buy uh, demand and supply from these assets, and they can pay these assets higher value. And, uh, and, uh, and what we uh, do is provide a cloud-based software where anybody can uh, uh, take an asset and uh, monetize it in the markets that are available around the world. So, so that's what we do. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Bonneville Power Administration, which is one of the largest utilities uh, in Pacific Northwest. Uh, they serve about 140 other smaller utilities in their area. They've put about five gigawatts of wind in their system. And as I mentioned, with wind, if the wind is not blowing, suddenly you see uh, a big drop in consumption and it needs to be, uh, uh, balance somehow. So instead of building backup generators, which are fossil fuel based, which would defeat the whole purpose of putting the wind in the first place, uh, they use a system uh, called demand response, industrial demand response, where they pay their end customers some incentive to modulate their consumption. And they have been able to add about 50 megawatts of what they call balancing reserves. It's a fast responding uh, resource that has to come online uh, as the wind is uh, changing at one-tenth the cost of what it would take them to build a backup generator or a fossil fuel-based generator. Another example, uh, it's a company in Europe, uh, in Netherlands. Uh, they are one of the largest providers of wind, as well as retail electricity to their two million customers. Uh, they have a program where they are consolidating a number of combined heat and power plants in large commercial facilities. These are plants which are normally used to produce heat but they also have some flexibility where, if they can, uh, uh, where they can change the output uh, and produce electricity and, and modulate how much electricity is produced. So they're able to take this untapped, underutilized resource and aggregate it over hundreds of their customers and create a reserve which can then be traded into the wholesale electricity markets uh, and, and can create uh, tens of millions of value uh, for themselves and for their uh, end customers while providing a resource which is 100% clean. So this is very interesting because this is a use case which is not driven by any regulatory need. This is not driven by any grid sort of uh, need. This is a use case uh, where the customer, in this case, Eneco, is a trader and they are just maximizing their profit. And uh, I think that's, a, that's an important point because in, in a lot of these uh, new areas where you are trying to create uh, 
value for the society. It's sometimes not clear who is going to pay for this. And once you can mot motivate the traders who are profit driven to actually find the value, then you can scale some of these technologies very, very quickly. And, uh, and they can get deployed uh, much faster than if it, it was only uh, reliant on, on some rebates. Another example, uh, which is also very, uh, very interesting, this is a large telecom company. Uh, they operate many different exchanges where they have a need for providing uh, backup uh, power in case the electricity is not available. So they have these exchanges where they are putting backup solar, uh, I mean solar panels, backup storage, uh, some other uh, backup generators, where now, because uh, they can aggregate these resources and they can trade them into the markets, they can uh, create about 30 million per year of value that was untapped before, uh, uh, before a system like this was available. So again, this is an end customer driven use case. They have to put these resources anyway for their backup needs. Uh, but having access to the markets reduces the cost for them to deploy uh, lithium ion and other type of uh, storage technologies. Finally, I'll talk about a completely uh, different type of use case. Here uh, uh, is an example of a large utility in the East Coast. Uh, they have about uh, 4.5 million customers that they serve, uh, so it's almost the size of PG&E. Uh, they have instrumented every single uh, home uh, with these smart meters. They have also instrumented most of their feeders. They have about 3,000 feeders that supply electricity to these four and a half million customers. And in this case, what they're doing is uh, they're looking at the data that is coming from all of these sensors across the distribution network, uh, from the homes, uh, which is traditionally sitting in many different systems, and consolidating that in a way where they can now start looking at patterns which are leading indicators of when an outage might happen in the future. And the idea is to be able to find these outages about four hours to a week in advance, uh, which means that it's actionable. They can actually send out a truck to do a vis visual inspection and then replace the faulty equipment before the customer even notices or experiences an outage. So we, we did this work with them. Uh, uh, over this summer, where just in the first three months of putting the system into production, we were able to save about 600,000 minutes of cumulative outages on their system. These are outages which would have happened but didn't happen because we were able to find these fine-grained signatures uh, coming from these instruments uh, and use that to, to send them uh, signals. And what is cool is that every time they send out a, a truck, they send us a picture uh, of what was broken, and they send us these broken insulators and, and things like that, which. Uh, would be very hard to find on a 50 mile feeder uh, if, if they don't know precisely where to go and look for these type of patterns. This is again, very powerful use of uh, big data technology and data science, where you can uh, just sit in a control center and observe these signal patterns and find out what might be happening on your network. So these are some of the, the uh, uh, examples. I have tons of examples, but uh, I want to open it up. Just a quick sort of background on uh, the company. We, uh, we started in 2000. Uh, 11 really, we got incorporated in 2010. We are about 50 people. Uh, we are growing in almost all geographies right now. Uh, one of the great challenges and opportunities for this is that it is a truly global network. It's more global than the internet. And so no matter which part of the world you go, either you already have an electricity network or people desperately need one. Uh, either way, it actually is a massive opportunity. So we are expanding. We are working with about 20 global uh, energy companies across this value chain. Uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, now, at the core of this, I, I also want to touch upon what is the core technology. I mean, there is a lot of use cases and business value. But at the core of it is this ability to take data from millions of assets, which are now getting connected, and uh, analyze this data in real time so that we can optimize this very, very large network at scale. And, uh, and the, the idea of basically taking this data and not just uh, finding signatures, but then uh, controlling is very uh, central to a number of supply chains. Uh, of course, electricity is the ultimate just-in-time supply chain where you have to balance demand and supply. But if you look at any network, whether it's the peer-to-peer, uh, a ride sharing network or it's the airlines network, you have started seeing uh, more and more, not just the demand being variable, but the supply itself uh, could be very variable. And the opportunity that we have is to see how we can uh, look across the supply chain uh, through the sensors that are getting deployed across the, uh, what I call the industrial internet, 
and then find ways to optimize the supply chain in real time so that we can balance demand and supply more efficiently. And this is what I call convergence of IT and OT, where we are putting these IT technologies around big data and machine learning, but we are using that to uh, then uh, optimize and control the assets in real time, uh, ideally uh, without a human in the loop. And that, I believe, is, is going to become the essence of what we are calling the industrial internet and the fourth, fourth industrial re uh, revolution, where we can now, uh, in real time, take very complex networks and optimize. And these networks are self-optimizing. So you can do this optimization in a distributed manner in real time. And the system is always uh, working at maximum efficiency. It's self-reliant, uh, self-healing. Uh, if something breaks down, it can reconfigure itself and, uh, and continue to work. And energy is a great uh, sort of first use case around it because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not only uh, just in time supply chain, it's also very critical to, uh, 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 to, to, uh, to humanity in general and, and to our progress. So, so making sure that this system works 24 seven in real time uh, uh, is of utmost importance in, in industry, uh, in, in, in energy compared to many other uh, areas. But I think this is where uh, I see uh, the big opportunity for us, uh, for, for all of you here who are sitting uh, uh, in the lecture, uh, to start thinking about how you can uh, take advantage of this massive volume uh, of data and uh, come up with new business models which will uh, let you squeeze out more efficiency throughout uh, the industrial sort of supply chain. So with that, uh, I'll just leave uh, with this final thought uh, where, uh, if you look at the history, I mean, throughout this history, we have always uh, equated energy with the consumption of natural resources, uh, whether it's uh, coal or uh, uh, natural gas. But now for the first time, uh, software has given us the opportunity to really think of data as a new source of energy. And apart from being cheap and uh, clean, data is different from all other resources in one key way, is the only resource which is still growing. And so uh, I think that uh, this is a fantastic opportunity. I would love to talk to all of you after the talk to see if any of, one of you are interested in exploring this more and uh, uh, looking forward to that conversation. Right, so as I mentioned in my talk, uh, I was in the semiconductor industry, uh, did that for about 15 years, went all the way from when we first started thinking of deep, uh, I mean, submicron was a big deal, and then deep submicron and 40 nanometers, and uh, was on that uh, trajectory for a long time. And after watching that movie uh, repeat itself many times, I was just uh, thinking of doing something else. And around that time, this is about five, six years ago, um, I ended up watching uh, some uh, sort of movies in this area, like uh, one of the influential movies that I watched was uh, uh, by Vice President Gore, The Inconvenient Truth. And I watched it with my son, actually. Um, and then as I, and he was five years old at that time. And as I was like dropping him to the school the next day, he started crying and he was very moved. And he said, hey, what, uh, uh, I mean, he was afraid that he won't even have any oxygen to breathe when he grows up. So that's like, sort of got me thinking about uh, these big problems. Until that time, actually, I'd never thought I would be in this field. I never, uh, I did some undergraduate courses in India a uh, long time ago, dealing with power systems. Uh, never thought I would ever do anything related to power systems. And uh, it all came back to me, actually. It's very surprising how these things that you do, which you have to do sometimes, uh, and you never think that uh, they will ever be useful. Uh, turn out to be interesting uh, sort of uh, training uh, that can help you later on in the life. But then, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of things that you learn, the things that I did at Berkeley around uh, trying to look at problems and trying to see what you can apply that you know to a new problem uh, was, uh, was applicable here. And in fact, the, a lot of things that I'm doing are things that I used to do in the semiconductor area as well. So. <clears throat> So uh, from a technology perspective, it was not very hard, but I think from a mindset perspective, thinking about a completely new uh, 
problem, and then thinking that you can actually do something there is obviously a, uh, a bit of a leap. Uh, but that's the beauty of being at a school. I, I was fortunate to spend some time at Stanford around that time, but uh, whether you are here, you are at Stanford, you just get this opportunity to take a step back and start thinking about big problems in a completely new way. And then you have uh, a group of people around you who can come and help you. So, so that's how I got started. Right, I can get used to this. <laughs> My name is Tyree Kayshawn. Um, actually, uh, majoring in entrepreneurship and technology myself. So it's beautiful to have you in the room. Um, I have two questions. Uh, my first is, I realize that some of the personal information and data that will be gathered by sensors and other types of smart technology uh, can be used against consumers by corporations. So how would you encourage students to discover effective strategies to ensure that our personal information remains secure, although corporations will be gathering it? And my second is, um, in what specific ways would you encourage entrepreneurs to get involved with big data rather than solely selling the information to corporations or companies? Right, so I think privacy and security, which are... Uh related but two different things uh, is a big issue and uh, I think it's also a big opportunity. The way I look at it is there is no really good answer to this but uh, it needs to be done in an open and transparent manner if the data is being collected and the way this data is being used and uh, the models that are emerging at least in the energy industry are based on uh, consent of the user uh, giving access to that data uh, to service providers who can add value to them. Uh, uh, and, and using that data for, uh, for that value-added service. And so uh, uh, I think it's a great question, no clear, easy answer. I think there are a lot of opportunities around this to find uh, solutions around security as well as uh, privacy. Uh, but the industry is uh, coming up with a set of, I would say, conventions and rules around it to, uh, to keep uh, data secure. I think we have to just balance the need of security and privacy along with uh, the need for uh, uh, the improving the uh, improving the underlying system and squeezing out uh, more uh, efficiency out of this. Now the second question on uh, entering uh, the data science field. I mean, I think this is the perfect place. Uh, just interact with uh, uh, people around you. I was fortunate to get the tour of the new uh, design center that that has started. Uh, I think the more dots that you connect here, the uh, the more ideas you will get, and that will help you get into a new area, uh, whether it's data science or, or any other area that you find uh, uh, interesting. I, I always like to think of the problem first and see what the big problem is, and then see what technologies can be brought uh, to, uh, to solve those problems, and whether these are big data problems or other things. Either you can get trained yourself, or you can find a set of people around you who can help uh, solve those problems. Hello, is this on? All right, hello, uh, I'm Tyler Chen. Um, I'm a material science major, um, and kind of because of that, obviously I'm not super into the whole software side, but do you see that there are any applications of big data um, outside of the pure software realm, if there are any applications of kind of using big data to create hardware products uh, that maybe, I don't know, uh, can influence that side as well? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the whole notion of uh, getting more insights from whatever system you're trying to design uh, is fundamentally a, I mean, a, a analysis and at some level big data problem. I mean, whether you are doing the conventional uh, Hadoop map reduce type of big data or whether you're doing high performance computing uh, to find out whether your hardware is going to survive in a harsh climate, uh, they are uh, different mathematical techniques, but it's all around anticipating a very large number of possible uh, scenarios and how your system is going to work and applying those uh, techniques in there. Now, of course, uh, uh, you can build physical models and try to analyze some of these things, uh, but now with the capability to process large number of scenarios and large amount of data, you can automate a lot of 
uh, these technologies and uh, and and use that to design better products. So that's that's what comes to my mind. But I'm sure you guys will figure out even more interesting uses there. And uh, one more. Also, do you think that um, there would be a way to kind of start from the actual data itself and use maybe trends that are visible in that data to narrow down a new hardware product? Do you think that's kind of a possible route that this kind of whole big data realm could take in the future? I mean, I, I don't see why not at some point. I think uh, it's, a, it's an interesting, I would say, idea uh, to explore. I think certainly to the extent that you can uh, infer design features, uh, that's already happening. And, uh, and maybe whether you can completely sort of synthesize something new. I think in biology and other fields, uh, some of these things are beginning to happen, actually. So I mean, I, I don't know whether uh, in the near future you can just assemble a new car based on data or not. But uh, certainly, with artificial intelligence and ro robotics and other things, there are like steps already in that direction where uh, the intelligence is actually uh, in machines is getting to a stage where they can start doing some really interesting uh, things autonomously. So I can see that happening in uh, in 20 years, 10, 15 years, whatever. Maybe the next PhD student is already working on that as we speak. Uh, hi, I'm Ali Ahmed, and I'm just curious the companies that you're working with, they're really established, have a lot of resources. Um, are you ever afraid that they're going to copy your business model and then just, since you know they're collecting the data themselves, hire their own team within their business to just, I mean, do what you do? Yes and yes and no. I mean, like the, the things are moving so fast. At some level, you just have to run instead of worrying about others copying. The things are changing so fast. If you are at the forefront of this uh, and you are pushing the frontiers, then you uh, you just try to be ahead of them. And I think people do specialize. The, the more things get complicated, the more uh, specialization uh, and disaggregation it requires across the value chain. And so for, uh, and I've seen that in, in my own career in other industries. For example, in the semiconductor world, today most people don't build their own fabs. They go to TSMC or one of these fabs. Uh, their IP is more on the design side. Most people don't. Uh, most semiconductor companies don't uh, write their own software to design their chips. They buy commercial software. So as these things become more and more involved and they become more complex, uh, the investment that is needed uh, to keep up with the new technology uh, is so high that for one of these companies to make that investment and create state-of-the-art tools is going to be hard, while for a company which is purely focused on software can hire the best people and can amortize that cost over a large number of use cases and can potentially stay uh, much further ahead of, of a company which is focused on hardware and their core competency is uh, running the grid or, or managing their system. So I do think that as things get more uh, complicated, they get more specialized and uh, they get more disaggregated. In that sense, I'm not too worried about that trend. Hi, my name is Ruta. I'm also a computer science major here. I was wondering, you mentioned that Internet of Things is one place where there's a lot of opportunities in smart grid. Could you go a little bit more into depth about uh, what specifically an Internet of Things applies to smart grid and how you're using that? Yes, yeah, so if you look at the Internet of Things, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, initial products that are coming out are still searching for a business use case. Uh, and uh, there are consumer-related products like Fitbit and so on. Uh, uh, and that's one interesting area for sure. Uh, and I would put things like Nest thermostat or any smart thermostat in that category, connected lighting, which is happening in the, uh, in the homes in terms of LED lighting in that category. Electric cars would be in that category. All of these connected things have multiple value streams that they can potentially offer to the end consumer. So uh, one of the value streams could be just convenience, or it could be maybe something related to health uh, or monitoring. But there is a pretty large opportunity, which I uh, talked about, around managing uh, the grid and providing services to the grid. And that is a good source of uh, money for the companies who are making these connected devices. And if you look at the industry, I mean, I've seen some surveys where it turns out that uh, 
the energy industry is seeing the fastest adoption of Internet of Things. Uh, and, and the reason is that the use cases are very well defined and the amount of money that is available is very significant, which drives uh, the adoption of these devices uh, themselves. And so monetizing that value chain, whether it is uh, by selling flexibility that I talked about or by uh, reducing outages or improving the reliability of the system are some of the opportunities that we are working on. But uh, there are like many such uh, things that can be done in terms of reducing the cost for the end consumer or providing a better quality service. So to clarify, do you mean that um, like the biggest opportunity right now would be to sell optimization? Is that what you mean by flexibility? No, I mean, optimization is needed as a technology uh, to uh, get more out of your flexibility. But I think just making these devices which are connected, which can participate in these markets, which can be controlled, uh, and which, uh, which can uh, drive the adoption of, of some of these uh, devices is, I think, the bigger opportunity out there. So whether it's... Uh, <clears throat> making a battery system connected, which can now participate in the markets, or making an HVAC system, which is uh, running the uh, uh, the system. I mean, which is running in this building more connected, so that now you can get more insights into this. Uh, I think those are some of the bigger opportunities because they drive uh, more value and more more use cases. And software becomes a piece of that equation, because to get that last uh, sort of. Uh, layer of value, you have to analyze that data and you have to somehow figure out what to do with that data. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Get one down here. Hi, I'm Joanne, political economy major. I was wondering, um, since you're working with big data in the energy industry and that's relatively new, could you talk about maybe the difficulties that you're encountering because it's like a new thing in the field? Yeah, great question. I mean, so I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the whole issue around education and awareness, the, the realization or, or making people realize what the value is, what the business use cases are, um, is, is, a, is a fairly big challenge. And the, uh, one of the challenges which is particular to the energy industry is that sometimes the benefits are for the society. But if you want to sell a service, you need to monetize it against a particular user uh, I mean, or, or a customer, and figuring out what the motivations for those customers are is not always uh, clear. For example, I mean, in a, a lot of areas, electricity theft is a big issue. Uh, in India, for example, on an average, 30% of electricity is lost uh, to theft. Even in the US, uh, it's the third largest uh, stolen commodity after credit cards and, uh, and automobiles. So it's a, it's a $6 billion I mean, sort of problem in, in the United States. But, uh, solving this problem is not necessarily a very high value problem for, uh, for anybody actually, because the utilities pass it on to the rate payers, the rate payers don't see uh, the cost on a day-to-day -day basis, and so how do you sort of monetize this uh, starts becoming a challenge. So that's what we have done over the last three to four years, apart from building the technology, I think trying to get an insight into who would pay for a service and why would they pay and how does it impact their bottom line and their business model is, is pretty tricky. And it needs to work in the regulatory framework even though you try to change it, uh, there is still a, a, a lot of regulation around how you can charge for these services and uh, how your customers actually monetize these services. Thank you. Yeah. And our oldest student. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I was, your uh, three cases that you, you showed, three or four, the last one where you were um, doing predictive analytics to try to understand that something was about to break down and the reliability and all that, that one is actually very different than all of your other cases. The other ones are kind of like Airbnb for energy, but this other one, somehow you're able to sense and measure and all of these things, which I was wondering if you could talk to what in what you actually can sense and what data you can apply and how you could actually understand that a device here in the grid has a problem versus you know or just to even know that it has a problem and then to actually know where it is right so i think the, these use cases are different and i have many such use cases but they have a very uh, similar underlying pattern that we see across many different applications and that's a pattern around uh, taking data doing some large scale predictions using machine learning 
and then doing some sort of optimization, which then ties it back to the asset itself. So, so in that sense, uh, even this last application, although it looks very different, is uh, it fits very nicely in that sort of real-time optimization loop uh, uh, that I was talking about. But in general, uh, I mean, uh, there are about 60 plus patterns that we have right now. And these patterns could be simple things around uh, the operation of the device when they're turning on and off. Sometimes a device might uh, shut down for a few seconds and it comes back, but it could be an indication of a bigger problem. So if you see that happening too many times, that could be an indication of something bigger. Uh, other uh, patterns could be waveforms that are coming from the sensors in terms of voltages and power factors and currents. Um, you, we also look at harmonics and some uh, frequency domain things. So, in there. so your customers, uh, the the people who you're working with, they they are measuring all these things, and somehow they're sending you this information, maybe in packet form or whatever, so that you can you can analyze it. Right, and that's where the other question around where the opportunity on Internet of Things is. There are. Uh, dozens or maybe even hundreds of companies who are making these sensors. And every company who makes a sensor claims that this is the best thing since sliced bread in terms of this sensor being able to solve uh, 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 a big problem around whatever you are trying to sense, basically. But the reality is that uh, the value is in combining data from many such sensors. And the companies who are deploying these sensors are having a hard time figuring out which sensor is really giving me a meaningful pattern that I, I, I can uh, uh, base my predictions on. So part of the value that we are providing is this ability to look across many different sensors and figuring out uh, what is the sequence of uh, events that need to happen which leads to an outage. So it may be a pattern in one device followed by another pattern in another device and a sequence of such patterns which is a much higher indication, indicator of an outage than any one of these patterns on, uh, on its own. And, so, so, and that's where machine learning comes in because you have literally millions of sensors and you have uh, uh, even more features that you can be analyzing and then putting all of that in a big system where you can uh, learn and figure out what the patterns are that really matter is important. So doing high dimensional machine learning and then uh, being able to evaluate these models in real time as the data is streaming in is where uh, technology helps. Uh, I want to thank you again for spending your time and energy with us this afternoon. Uh, and also wanted to say, I think if you're going to be here for a little while if students want to come up and, and ask questions. And I hope that you'll come back to Berkeley again very soon. So thank Absolutely. you. Thank you.